Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Mental Health Family Hour. Now it's great to be back with you before Christmas. We're joined by some wonderful guests who I will introduce shortly. So just to touch on some housekeeping very briefly, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat and Dave will be monitoring this as we go along and we will answer them at the end. If you want to ask any questions after the episode, please email me on sam.tyre, T-Y-R-E-R, at lscft.nhs.uk. So just to sort of drop in there, which we was talking about beforehand, some recent news, um, which we didn't mention in the last episode, was myself and Dave have been fortunate enough to win an award called the Point of Light Award from the Prime Minister, which is absolutely fantastic news. So I'd just like to personally say thank you for people that have tuned in, that have shared, because that award, means a great deal to myself and Dave so thank you we've managed to reach so many people now and the feedback has been absolutely excellent so thank you very much for that if you are tuning in for the first time just to give you an introduction to who myself and Dave are uh, my name's Sam Tyra and the prevention and engagement lead at Lancashire and <laughs> South Cumbria Foundation Trust I'm also the founder of a service called Change Talks, which is an educational program which has been delivered throughout Lancashire and South Cumbria uh, to basically prevent mental health issues and Dave. I didn't expect him to finish that quickly. So uh, I am Dave Cottrell, aka Mindset by Dave. I am a mindset and mental health coach who works with people one to one and in groups. And um, if you are watching on the live stream version of this on Twitch, I am the owner of this channel where I do a mental health drop in chat every Tuesday from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. and every Saturday from 7 p.m. till 10 p.m. I think that's our shortest introduction we've ever done. <laughs> I've ever, done a lot. I've done a lot of introductions <laughs> this year, and I've had to. Yeah. I've had to whittle it down from the four to five minute one that I really like. So now I'd like to introduce our, our fantastic <laughs> guests. So today we are joined by Colin, Sarah, and Anne. So Colin, would you like to go first, please? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So my name is Colin Bowman, uh, and I am a participation and engagement officer of the Lancashire Carer Service. So my role. Uh, me, means that I, are, on the one hand, engage with carers, um, but I also engage with a lot of professionals up and down in Lancashire, um, whether that's in the NHS, or care, third sector organisations. And it's just really about sort of building carer awareness within our community and um, just letting everybody know what support is available. Brilliant. Thank you, Colin. Sarah? Hi, oh, yes, I'm Sarah. I work for Encompass, and which is part of Lancashire Carers Service. And I'm an assessment and support officer in mental health. So I support carers who care for an adult with a mental health um, difficulty. I've been working in mental health for quite a number of years. Previously, I was a carer support officer, again, in mental health. So I support the carer in caring for somebody with a mental health difficulty and uh, providing lots of different support and carrying out carers assessments, etc. So uh, there are many supports that carers don't know about until they come into the service. So I'm all about about care, carers and mental health. Yes, that's what I do. And we can talk about some of them services that are available shortly, actually. It'd be great to find out a little bit more. <coughs> and Anne? Hi, my name's Anne. Um, I am a parent carer for uh, my son, who is an adult now. Um, I've been doing that for approximately six years. I do work full time as well. Um, and I've accessed um, some of the services that, um, you know, are available. And I just wanted to come and talk to people about things that I found helpful and useful and can hopefully help them. Thanks, Anne. And I'd just like to say, you know, thank you for coming on to share your experiences as well. I know how difficult um, that can be, you know, from myself and Dave sharing our own experiences as well. So a big thank you. And we will come back to talking about your experiences uh, very, very soon. First of all, um, Colin and Sarah, could you just tell me a bit more about um, the services that you offer? Yeah. So the Lancashire uh, Carer Service is commissioned by Lancashire County Council. Uh, with the primary aim of uh, identifying and supporting um, carers, adult carers uh, across the ge geographical footprint um, of the county council. And our role is just to make sure that they get the help and the support that they really need. Um, and one of the big things um, that, that we found during this pandemic and, and the restrictions and the lockdowns are often finding themselves at the forefront and taking a lot more of the responsibility for caring than, than, than say, previously. 
Um, our role is to provide them with things like the, the statutory carers assessment, which identifies all of the help and the support that they may need, um, ranging to an emergency contingency plan called the Peace of Mind for Carers plan, um, and also sort of ranging into a lot of sort of what we call the wraparound service, which is well-being support, offering a lot of peer-to-peer -peer support for carers, which is vital um, given where we are now with the pandemic and things like that. And Sarah? Yeah, so to, as an assessment and support officer, there are two elements. Um, I do carry out the carers' assessments. Predominantly at the moment during the pandemic, they've been by telephone. Previously, we do a lot of work in the community, but yeah, I carry out carers' assessments with carers. And I think it's a really great way for carers to be able to talk <clears throat> about their caring role. Um, it goes into lots of different areas. And most importantly, um, how they're affected by that. And that kind of gives us the cue to to look at different areas that could be they could be supported in. So care as a supplement, we feel it's really important, sometimes first, first stop for that. Um, the support element is, yeah, we support carers. I mean, we refer carers on to other agencies, for example, you know, for counselling or CBT. Um, and we also provide something called the carers help and chat line for support. That's a dedicated phone line. So carers have got someone to talk to you know, when they're really stressed, because we recognise that it's really, really stressful for carers, and especially, you know, at the moment. And um, our, develop our wonderful development team have put together something called the Carers Community Network. Now, that's an online platform. I'm sure Colin will expand on that. Um, and we've got, I think at the moment, about 700 carers just being able to connect with others, really peer support, virtual coffee and chats, Zoom meetings. And it's a really good way of connecting when ordinarily people can't meet in the community to support each other. So, you know, the job that I do is connecting people, um, whether that's digitally or using the phone, coming through the carers assessment <laughs> and things like that. So, uh, yeah, a lot of support. There's a lot of things that we do that very often carers aren't aware of until they come maybe to come to have a carer's assessment. So carer's assessment, we feel, is a really, really useful thing. And how have, you, how have you found sort of adapting to everything having to be via a phone? Yeah, I mean, initially, uh, we, we always carried out telephone assessments anyway, because not everybody wants to meet face-to-face. -face. Yes, it was a challenge initially, but it makes no difference because we're still asking the same questions. We're still supporting carers, you know, on the phone. Uh, and we also do reviews and we kind of catch up with people about six or to eight weeks after we've done an assessment. So there's kind of ongoing support. Once a carer comes into the service, um, they very often said, you know, if we don't know something, we've got a point of contact, which is really important. And part of the carer's assessment does address a carer's mental health, which I feel is really important. Uh, and sometimes carers haven't been asked how they feel. So, um, yeah, it's, it's I think it's an amazing thing to do for carers. It's very personal. And sometimes it's the first time carers have talked about how they feel. And I think during the pandemic, it's, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, sometimes we can offer a lifeline and support. Yeah. Can, can I ask then, Anne, on, on sort of on, on that topic, do you feel that you've been asked how you are quite frequently? Um, I think certainly initially when... Um, you know, my son was diagnosed, the focus and quite rightly so was on him. Um, you know, everything was about trying to to help and assist him. Um, and I think it was quite a way down the line when I was almost at breaking point that somebody actually turned around, one of the, the home treatment team turned around and actually said, you're now really struggling aren't you and it was that whole thing of being able to turn around and say do you know what yes I am and from there I was referred for a carer's assessment and you know we we, we did the whole thing we got the the peace of mind plan and it was an absolute you know breath of fresh air to know that there was you know someone that I could turn to to discuss you know how I was feeling um and I wished I'd have had that earlier to be fair that would have you know been very helpful much earlier on in our journey um yeah. so yes it was a lifeline to me without a doubt and and how have you sort of found this this whole lockdown period since the beginning of March have you found it more of a challenge have you found um, the support there for you um to be fair 
not too bad. Um, you know, the person that I care for has found it incredibly difficult. So it has put additional pressure <laughs> on. But um, because I normally work from, um, you know, from my workplace, I've been working from home. So that has actually helped me with my caring duties. Um, so it, it, it's it's been a positive in that way. Um, yep. But as far as sort of the additional, um, you know, support is concerned, um, you know, my son has res- not been able to have as much face-to-face support. So it does make a difference to him, yeah. yeah. And could, could you tell us, Anne, if, if you don't mind, and I'm sorry if this is a bit a bit personal, could you could you tell us a bit about sort of the struggles that you faced uh, caring for someone with, with mental health difficulties? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, certainly sort of the struggles initially were that um, his condition came completely out of the blue. Uh, We had no experience of, um, you know, the conditions that he was up against. Um, There was a complete lack of information. We didn't know where to turn. It was a very scary experience. Um, And because he was uh, age 16 or over, um, you know, as parents, you know, you want to... sort of help your children and, and, and put things right for them. And we just couldn't. It was way beyond what we were able to deal with. Um, so it was learning, you know, about who can help, the processes, you know, the crisis team or home treatment team being involved. And they needed to get to know us too. So it was very much a learning curve. You know, they didn't know anything about us as a family. So it was it was getting that um sort of relationship built up between the services that were helping my son and us so that we could work as a team um so it was a it was a a very big learning curve and um you know, there was a complete lack of information out there for carers to refer to at that time. But we are talking sort of six years ago now and yeah. things have changed massively for the better. Um, you know, sort of later later on in the process, um, you know, I was referred to uh, the REACT toolkit, which was which is something that was set up with Lancaster University and the NHS. Um, and that was an absolute godsend that's you know it's um it's a website where it's called a a relatives education and coping toolkit and to actually be able to access that and see videos of other people going through what we were going through as a family was you know mind-blowing it really was it made me feel so much that I wasn't alone and that we weren't the only family going through this um so that was an absolute lifesaver and I would wholeheartedly recommend that I wished we'd have had that earlier it wasn't available right at the start but if we'd have been able to be signposted to that right at crisis point when everything you know started you know evolving we would have worried a lot less we'd have had that information and I think that's really key. So that was specific to my son's, um, you know, sort of mental health issues. So that it, it's it's actually uh, specifically for psychosis or bipolar. So although that is quite specific, there are other things available, other, you know, websites available now that can help people with all different mental health conditions. But that particularly was a, a lifeline. What was the name of that? that I'm sorry. The React, React, React Toolkit. Toolkit. I've personally never heard of this, and I think it sounds absolutely fantastic. So is that free to access, Anne? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's reacttoolkit.uk, uh, and it stands for Relatives <coughs> Education and Coping Toolkit. So for, 12, sorry, Anne. I'm going, to get, I'm going to get a link to it put in the chat. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I was referred to Minds Matter um, for, you know, help for me to deal with sort of the stress and anxiety relating to, um, you know, the whole situation, really. And do do you think it made it more difficult because of his age as well? Yes, I do, because sort of age 16, it's, it's sort of middle ground. You know, he is a young adult and, um, you know, when he, he first you know, became involved with the services, they didn't know what we were about as a family. We could have been part of the problem that, you know, they don't know until they get to know you. So it was actually quite scary that he was, you know, taken off 
by people we didn't know when we knew he was very poorly. And, um, you know, they wanted to section him and send him down south. To, that was the yeah. only place there was a bed. And that was very difficult to cope with. We, you know, we absolutely did not want that to happen. Um, so fortunately, we, ha- we hung on and he got a more local bed. Yeah. And did, did sort of the, the, the stigma around that, do, do you feel that you got good support from family and friends or were, were people sort of like, oh, I, I just can't understand this? Um, I think there was a, a big lack of understanding. I also think that my son uh, didn't want people knowing, um, you know, what he was dealing with. There is There is a massive stigma still about mental health conditions and although yeah. we are chipping away at that you know on a week to week basis it is still very much there particularly with the older generation um you know certainly within my family um you know people don't understand what's going on um so it is you know we are making huge progress with that though um but it's a fine line between being able to discuss it with close family members and respecting people's privacy yeah. So, um, you know, once we got further down the line, I was able to sort of open up to more family members and that helped me as a support mechanism. Yeah. And do, do you find that they all understand a lot more now as well? 100%. Yeah. yeah. 100%. It's, you know, it's it's certainly, I mean, it was a massive learning curve for us. So, you know, for, for the wider family, you know, even more so. Yeah, and I think it's such a difficult age as a as a young man, especially because it was it was seventeen when everything sort of happened to me, and I started struggling. Yeah. So I can understand, you know, it, it must have been difficult for for him as well, oh, feeling yeah. like he didn't want 100%. anyone to know. Do, do, do you, you find that over the years, in. yeah, At that age you just want to blend in, fit in, and not stand out in any way? Yeah. Um, so yeah. And and, and has these has, has the services that you've you've received allowed you to have more open conversations with your son as well do you think that they've helped support that yes i think they have yeah he has a key worker who is invaluable um you know he very much encourages my son to um he, he you know the way he goes about it is he encourages him to chat about it in a roundabout way instead of the direct questions. So it sort of comes out in conversation and helps him explore what he's actually thinking, what he's experiencing. Um, but it, it just comes out in conversation, which is really good. So yeah, yeah, very skilled at that. And, and what, what would you advise parents that are in a similar position to yourself at the very early stages? What advice would you give them? I think you've got to look after yourself. Um, you know, the the mistake that I certainly made was, obviously, as a parent, you know, your whole being is about protecting your children, supporting them, helping them through these things. And, you know, as a family, we focused so much on that, that, you know, it was a 24-7 caring role at that point very little sleep involved um you know and you do get to that burnout point really you know i i consider myself quite a resilient person um but i think you know certainly that that sort of the sort of situation we were in means that you can get to burnout really quite quickly and you know getting to breaking point means that you cannot then help the person you are caring for so it's so important to try and, and, you know, look after yourself as well. And it's finding the people who can do that for you. So whether that be friends, family members, services, um, you know, and making sure that you get that little bit of time out is, is essential. Yeah. And do, do you find, sorry, I'm, I, I don't like asking sort of personal questions and stuff, but it, it's, it, it's really good to open up the conversation on these topics. Do you find that there is a real stigma about, talking openly within the workplace for example that uh, you are an adult carer um, so I, I find that I, I know a few adult carers in our organisation and a few of them don't talk about it very openly and I'm just wondering why, why do you think that is? I think certainly when um, all this started six years ago it was incredibly difficult to talk about it and um, it was, I certainly felt that, um, you know, I had to take a, a big chunk of time off work because it was a 24-7 caring, you know, situation. You know, I'd become 
quite poorly myself with the stress and the anxiety of it all. Um, so my GP was very supportive, um, but my workplace less so at that point. Uh, however, things have changed massively for the better since then. Um, you know, my particular workplace has um, a huge well-being offering now. Um, I would feel much more uh, at ease talking openly about it now, but certainly six years ago, no, it was very difficult. It was almost swept under the carpet and not encouraged to be talked about at all. Um, uh, certainly, you know, at higher levels within sort of the management, you know, HR sort of things, it was very difficult. Um, but things have 100% changed for the better in that respect. Yeah, that's that's great to know. And are, are you accessing the, uh, Sarah mentioned an online, pl- uh, an online platform, are you accessing that as well? <clears throat> no, I'm not actually. I was very interested to hear about that. Um, so that is something that I will look into. Sarah, so to come back to you or Colin on this, so this is something that I've just jotted down. Could you just tell us a little bit more about this? Because I do think there will be a, a lot of people that are adult carers that would really appreciate accessing something like this. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah are you okay for me to talk about yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the um, the Carers Community Network is an online digital platform in which um, is was launched back in March, which um, fortuitously happened at the time of the first lockdown. Um, And what we've seen is we've seen this specific platform sort of grow um, just exponentially in the sense that it is, it's a bit of a, it's a bit like Facebook. It's a bit like WhatsApp. It's a bit like Messenger, but all rolled into one. And what it does is, is it allows the carer to act with other carers, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Because it's an online web-based uh, platform, it's you know an opportunity for carers to receive peer support or peer-to-peer support from each other. So at, at the moment, we've got 700 or 700 plus members on there now. Um, So what we're having is just amazing conversations in which a carer may post how they're feeling. They may post, you know, some useful information. And then very quickly, you have other carers leaving messages. So forming message threads, uh, you know, and and replying to that information. Uh, So we've, we've, I mean, we've got numerous examples of where we've, where carers have just, you know, experience some, um, you know, great signposting from other carers or great emotional support, as in, you know, they know exactly what they're going through. This is what helped them. We're seeing great sort of um, information sharing within a community. And, and one of the things that we love about the network is that it's a closed network. So only people, um, only the only people who can access this network um, have to be registered with the service. So it's, it forms a safe, vulnerable place for carers to be honest, you know, about how they're really feeling. So, so members of the public wouldn't be able just to log on. They have to come through the service, which then gives us, and, and we've got moderators and hosts on the platform, making sure that obviously everybody is safe and, and well and stuff. And But it is, what we're finding is just uh, amazing conversations and relationships being built because, you know, at any point of the day or night, a carer can just log on what's happening on the network, respond, ask questions. Um, and, and we're seeing carers, you know, log in at five o'clock in the morning um, over the weekend. We're, we're just seeing such a variety of support there. It's great. That's fantastic. And 700 members, you know, since yeah. March is absolutely fantastic. You know, that's credit yeah. to yourselves. I think think that is brilliant. Yeah. Just to touch, because we mentioned some numbers, we spoke before yeah. we came live just about the impact report. Could you just yeah. touch on yeah, that? Yeah, of course. Okay. So um, just to give you some stats. So um, within the year sort of 2019, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, 2019, 2020, um, the Lancashire Carer Service um, identified five 984 carers. So that's nearly 6,000 carers that were hidden, that had now been identified and actually supported. We've 
completed just over 4,000, so 4,038 new carers assessments. So that's those assessments that Sarah was talking about where we needs of carers so that we can get them the right support um, that, that, that they're entitled to. We've completed 1,526 peace of mind for carers plans. So that's the emergency contingency plans. If the carer has to be rushed into hospital as an emergency, there is a plan in place so that that cared for is looked after. We have completed 6,488 reviews of carers' assessments. Once you've had a carers' assessment, well then it will then be reviewed within 12 months. So, you know, that's a, just a, a great way of staying in contact with the carers. And supported 2,185 carers to take a break from their caring role. So again, you know, just as um, Anne and um, Sarah have mentioned, having a break from your caring role is just so, so important um, because it allows you to recharge, to look after yourself. Um, and just to say that um, we have 33,000 carers now registered with our service across Lancashire. So that's 33,000 carers registered with our service across Lancashire. Um, Sam, just to put that into a little bit of context, in the 2011 census, um, in which it identified, people were asked on the census as to, do you have a caring responsibility? Last figure came out and it was, within Lancashire, it was 130,000. So even though we have registered 33,000, we still only scratched the surface in identifying carers that are caring for somebody so there is, you know, the work that we're doing is fantastic, but there is still so much more to do. To offer that support. Can, can I ask on this then? Why, why, why do you think people are not accessing services? Because you mentioned about um, nearly 6,000 people that were hidden. Yes. Why, why is this? Um, to be honest, Sam, I would probably say it's to do with education and people not understanding the term carer. Um, because, I mean, I've been doing my role um, for a number of years now, so I've, I've interacted with many different carers, and I still think that in the wider community, in the general population, there is a, a, a misunderstanding. So as soon as you mention the word carer, often people think of care workers who work for domiciliary care providers. So you yeah. might ask a member of the public, can I just quickly ask, do you care for, for a family member and their natural reaction will be, no, 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 no. I, I, you know, we don't either have carers coming in or I'm not a carer myself. I don't work for a, a, an agency. So, so one of the things I think is, is around sort of um, thinking that a carer is a care worker. And I would say the other sort of dominant reason or the other uh, main reason is people tend to revert to what's called their primary label within a sort of a family relationship. So they often think of themselves as the husband, the wife, the son, the daughter, the mother, the yeah. you know, dad, and they don't think of themselves as a carer on top. So if I'm looking after my wife, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, and I'm the husband, then often I will think of it, it's my duty. I, I should be looking after my wife because I love her. So I don't like to be labeled as a carer because then that places some sort of either burden or extra responsibility than, than, say, my marriage, if you know what I mean. So, so I think in the many years that I've done this role, I've often asked people, do you consider yourself a carer? And they were, they were like, no, I've, I've been looking after my wife for the last 20 years. Um, I'm, I'm her husband. And so when you then say there is a carer's service that's there to support you, often people don't identify themselves as a carer, which then means that they don't identify with the service. And so often to get around that, a way that I engage with people is, I often say, do you help and support a family member, friend or relative who wouldn't manage if you withdrew that support or took that away? Um, and you've left the word carer out and you'd often get into a conversation where somebody will say, yeah, I help my mum. Okay, well, tell me a little bit of how you help your mum. 
Well, I do the shopping for her. I make sure she gets to the doctors. I make sure she takes the medication. You know, I make sure that I give her a call um, every couple of nights to make sure she's okay. And before you know it, you've entered into a very um, interesting conversation with somebody and you're there talking about a caring role, but you've not mentioned the word carer. And then the next question would be, well, are you aware that there is a service out there that can support you so that you, if you want to, can continue supporting your mum? That was a brilliant answer, Colin. <laughs> that, yeah, honestly, that, thank you. And just, so, just to touch on what Colin has said, did is that how you felt? Did you struggle to identify as a carer initially? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That just summed up how I felt completely. You know, I was a parent. I am a parent. That is my primary role. And um, I didn't identify as a carer at all until much later on. And there is also, you know, certainly from my son's situation, he doesn't like me being referred to as a carer because that then sort of you know, makes it out as if he needs caring for and he doesn't want to be seen like that either. So there is there is that side of things as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a strange situation really because identifying as a carer means you can access the support that you, you need and you deserve, you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's almost a double-edged sword really because it means that the person you are helping to look after needs that additional help. And some people don't like admitting that. So, you know, it is, it is difficult, but I think once you realize how many other people are in that situation as well, you know, and, and how many other people care for relatives, you know, family members, close friends, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it's it's like Colin says, it, you know, there are so many people out there who have no idea about the support that's on offer. Um, so, you know, it was quite a way down my journey, our journey as a family, that we began to sort of be aware of Lancashire carers and everything that they could offer. So it's about trying to get that message out any way that we can. And, and Sarah, have you got anything to input on, on this? Yeah, as I was listening to Colin and to Am there, I was thinking about, you know, the, the, the work that I do and those very two words, carers assessments, um, when someone comes through for the first time, it can be quite scary, isn't it? Carers assessment. And sometimes I have to spend time talking to people, explaining um, what's beyond those words, that it's actually, you know, it sounds like, well, I'm going to assess you uh, when it's not like that at all. It's actually just a way of carers being able to to talk about, you know, what they're doing. Say, but for me, more importantly, you know, the impact of that, how they feel. Um, and when carers understand that actually, yes, this is an op- And for some carers, it's the first time that they've been asked kind of quite how, like we were saying before, how do you feel? How does this affect you? What could help you? What could make the difference for you? And um, so, yes, so, so very often first time, yeah, being able to talk to somebody. And that's really a lot of what we do as assessment and support officers, just supporting a carer. Um, but very often getting over those two words initially, because mm. it, it sounds mm. extremely formal. Um and about, about being assessed but it's a way of somebody just listening and seeing if they can help mm. and do you find that carers are uh, the, the ones that you've worked with are very reluctant to talk about their own feelings you know in in general in general yes yes very often people say oh is it about the person i care for they've not um this is my experience no one's ever really asked them how they feel so it's all new um and sometimes that can be quite upsetting for people they've never actually been able to voice how they feel so uh, and then at the end have said actually i'm really glad we did this it isn't what i thought it was and and like colin and Anne were saying it's the way to access support but you have to go, kind of go through that process um yeah yeah, absolutely. Mm. Oh, thank you. Dave, sorry, I'm taking over all the questions here, by the way. <laughs> I, I've literally just said to the chat, actually, I said, my job today is to sit here and yeah. nod. Um, and someone's reminded me to smile while I'm doing it. Yeah. But um, you're making my job really, really easy. I could have done this on my first day back on Tuesday, to be perfectly honest, because I, I couldn't even finish sentences. Um, I have got a bunch of things I want to ask, if that's okay. Um, 
First of all, is and I think a lot of the viewers will be able to relate to this, is one of the most common things I hear is the whole, well, it's, I'm not the one with the problem. Why should I get help? Um, mm. And was there anything, was there like was there that sort of thought to you? Absolutely. I, I, it was all about putting my son first and getting the best help and support for him. That was my absolute priority. Um, but you've got to, you know, st- take a little step back and realise that, in order to help your relative as best you can, you have to help yourself as well. Yeah, 100%. What was it that helped you take that step? Because I know a lot of people that get stuck at that step. Uh, Lancashire Carers Assessment. That whole, I, you know, I felt nervous about it. I felt like an assessment would be something where I was being, um, you know, checked on or something you know it brought up images of you know was I doing a good enough job this type of thing when actually when I had my assessment I kept talking about my son and the person who did my assessment kept bringing me back to no this is about you this is helping you and you know having done you know sort of a period of time completely focusing on my son it was very difficult to then start to look inside and, you know, and how do I feel? And it it, it was, it was an opening of the floodgates because it was somebody listening to you and saying, but what about you? You know what I mean? So it was quite, it, it was, it was a floodgate because it was, you know, that whole release of emotions that had been going on for, you know, quite some time. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was difficult to do initially, but very therapeutic. Yeah, it's um, it's so common, like within within even within sort of self help circles or personal development circles, for people to say the expression, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. Absolutely. And so many people, particularly parents, are like, you know, watch me try. You know, it's like I'll <laughs> yeah. I'll just uh, I'll just keep going for it. What are what are some of the things that you now do? Some of the practices you now do to make sure that you're in your best condition to be able to look after your son. Yeah. Okay. So um, I took up reading again, which is a big escapism. Um, You know, it makes me relax, makes me sit down, makes me take time out. Um, So that's something that's really helped. I've also um, recently joined the Rethink Mental Health Group uh, that's been set up in my area um, for carers. And we had the first meeting of that um, last month and we've got the next one tomorrow. And that's very local to me there are rethink mental health groups support groups going on throughout the county i believe um but the first meeting of that was absolutely amazing because they were all carers in very similar situations and i do feel that that's going to be a very safe place to be able to open up and share you know like you say support experiences you know offload because i think as humans we don't like putting our worries and anxieties onto the people that we love Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's really quite good to have you know a separate group of people who really understand where you're coming from so I think that's going to be a massive help I'm really looking forward to becoming involved with that yeah excellent um so one of the things this isn't really a question it's more something that you made me realize something when you talked about um you know the stigma and, and, and sharing your son's story is the fact that the one the first person i wanted to get on this show to talk about caring for someone else with mental health was my wife because i actually have bipolar disorder myself uh, type yeah. two so the the easier of the two i guess um and i think the chat you know anyone who's watching it's worth disti- making the distinction that there is very different degrees of how highly you can function so i need a little bit of care from time to time um, from my wife not not a huge amount um but there are other people with the same the same disorder that would need substantially more but um i've talked about mine openly on social media whenever a friend asks how am i doing i i i respond quite literally all the time now because i find that like taking that mask off is well keeping that mask on is one of the things that's actually making me want to break most of the time um, but when actually my wife is still asked to this day, even though she knows that I literally go in front of people and talk about my bipolar disorder, she still finds it quite awkward to talk mm. about and would just say to people, oh, he's doing fine. You know, she'd like, she'd say she wouldn't, she feels uncomfortable sharing my dirty laundry, despite the, it's not even dirty laundry is a bad word for it. It's not my dirty laundry, but she feels uncomfortable sharing that side of things. Um, even though I actually 
go out there and talk about these things openly. So I think it can be extremely hard. And the stigma is like, as you said, when Sam asked the question earlier about, you know, why is this that more people don't talk about it? Well, it's because it's hard enough sharing your own stuff. When you're sharing someone else's, mm. you don't know whether you're overstepping the mark. You don't know. It's, it's, it's a difficult, it's difficult waters to navigate, should we say. Um, so as I say, it wasn't really a question. It was just sort of a, does that relate though? I suppose I'll turn it into a question. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's anybody's mental health is a personal thing. And I think it takes, you know, a really strong character to be able to, you know, discuss it openly with the general public. And um, I just think that as as parents, you know, we try and protect our mm. children or the family members that we or adults that we support and... I think it, you know, it is difficult ground. It is difficult ground because it's getting that balance right between helping other people through similar situations by, you know, sharing your experiences and the things that have worked for you, et cetera, but also respecting the privacy of, of you know, that, that family member. It is a fine line. Yeah. And I think the more that people open up and talk about it, the easier it will be in the long run for other families going through something similar. Yeah. And I suppose as well, like, you know, it's a, it's a worthwhile conversation to have if you are caring for someone, like what level are they happy for you to talk about things, you know, getting their consent from things, because it's one of those big things. I, I got naively when I started opening up about things, I got, I would say 99% of the time I got a great response. Um, and as a result, you know, we say about it being difficult to do, it's difficult to do the first time I found. And then obviously because of the responses coming, I found it quite gratifying to actually to talk about these things. Um, but a lot of people, they are, it's like that led me into it. I would say quite a naive kind of frame of mind that that's going to be everyone's experience for it. And it's unfortunate. That's just not true. Um, and that's the whole thing is that I remember when me and Sam sat down to do a men's round table and we'd had these four guys in the room and we were all talking openly about everything until the camera went on. And as soon as the camera went on, two out of the four of us and um, obviously not me and Sam <laughs> yeah, <we're> very open. <laughs> two out of four of us didn't want to answer certain questions and it was strange because we've been talking about those things moments earlier and I, I'm a big believer that in order for the stigma to be gone it's not just the people on the receiving end of the news it's the people on the giving end of the news we need to talk about these things proudly I, I, I talk about my bipolar disorder as a proud part of myself now it constructs who I am it makes me a much more empathetic person Yes, it makes me a little bit self-destructive, both at the top and the bottom, um, which is not often talked about, how you can be self-destructive at the top as well. But um, but not everyone would have that same experience. And it's like for me to sit there and say, well, yeah, you've got to do it. We've all got to do it. It is um, it is a sort of a step by step and doing it at your own pace. But especially when you're talking about someone else's, you've, I suppose, getting consent about what level they're happy for you to talk about is a is super important. <laughs> Sam, have you got uh, have you got anything else that you want to go into? Yeah, Sam? I have actually. I've got a bunch um, of questions so, from the chat. Well, let's get to your stuff first. So there was you mentioned before. I can't remember whether it was Sarah or Colin. Sorry, you mentioned um, giving carers the opportunity to take a break from the caring role. Could you expand on that a little bit more, please? In terms of you know how how. How do they have a break? Do they get support to go abroad, you know, on a holiday or whatever? I don't I don't know. <laughs> Definitely not that clearly by the last yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, we send them all off to yeah. Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can jump in there. Yeah. there Sam. Um, um, with the carers that I work for, there's kind of a, a couple of threads. So the more kind of formalised way is we can um, refer carers to adult social care to look at kind of eligibility for respite. Um Obviously, if, if that's something that a carer wants to do, some carers don't want to do it that way. But something that we um, we normally provide, say pre-pandemic, and hopefully when this is over, we'll open that out again, is something called a sitting in service. Now, this is trained trained volunteers that can kind of come in mutually between the person that you care for. It's all got to be agreed. It could be once a week, once a fortnight. However... <laughs> To do, and sometimes sitting in can be a little bit misleading because sometimes um, people can go out together just to give the carer a break. So this has worked <laughs> really, really well. Um, I think some great relationships have been built out of the sitting in service as well. So at the moment, it's temporarily 
on hold because of the pandemic, the face-to-face meetings. But hopefully, you know, once we come out of this, we can kind of... <coughs> So that's kind of a, a less formal way. So it's important that the people know that we do provide that sitting in service because that's whether that's an hour for the carer to go shopping or, mm. you know, go to the gym or do whatever, or just go for a walk. Um, yeah. So there's either the kind of more formal way we can refer to adult social care to kind of look at maybe carers coming in or, you know, some kind of respite or ourselves providing the sitting in service so um, and I'm there talking about sending them abroad <laughs> <laughs> well you never know it's something we can work towards <laughs> Sam, Sam can I just can you sort of add on to that as also just just to 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 say that um there is also the the possibility we do have um within the sort of so we work in partnership with Carers Link over in East Lancashire um who cover the sort of the four districts over there um, and what we've got is we've got the um, the ability um, of a static caravan as well. So so where obviously there it's it's sort of appropriate. Um, there is actually uh, provision, and there is the opportunity to to maybe sort of give um, you know a few carers that opportunity of a, a weekend away. That's not or, yeah. A break away yep. and stuff. So so again, you know. Um, it's, it's just really important that they do have that opportunity of, of potentially sort of having a break from their caring role. But yeah, so that, that is available as, as a carer's caravan. That's brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. I thought there was something similar, but then the word abroad come out. <laughs> you know what, let's just go with it. So ju- just to just to ask Colin and Sarah, I have had an email from someone that's watching at the moment that can't comment in the uh, comment section. Am I okay to share your email yeah. Or emails with this. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank yeah. you, Dave. Do you want to go to the the chat then with the questions? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna field the one at the bottom and then I'll work my way up because I've got something to say about the bottom one um, quite quickly um, because this is something that I come across in work all the time, which is someone says um, actually um, one thing I am worried about, and I'll let I'll let Anne follow on from me on this one, but one thing I'm worried about is that if I open the floodgates and start getting some support for me. I will burn out as it will leave me with even less time to care for my daughter. How do you manage this? Um, and I'll jump that over to you in a sec, but what this, this is something that's come up so many times in my work that I've got what I think of as a pretty decent answer for it. If you think what, when, as carers as, or anyone in a caregiving role, or even a parent who's not, is, you know, you are a carer as a parent, what we have a tendency to do is give away every little bit of our time to people, which is fine when we've got, when we're, when we're okay and we're operating at 100%. Mm-hmm. But what, and then when we go from 100% to 95%, we don't really notice it. It's just a 5% drop. But if we actually get down to like a sort of threshold of like 30%, that 5% we suddenly really notice. And what you'll find is the quality of the time that you're given to that person plummets. You might be given all 18, 19, 20 waking hours of the day to looking after that person or other people. But the quality of those 18, 19, 20 hours is 5%, 10%. You're not the version of you that you were when you were all the way up here. So as a result, if you multiply that time by the percentage, what you're actually giving to that person is the dregs of what you've got. It's it's it, You're actually already at burnout. Now, if you take a, even a small amount of time out of that for yourself and actually look after your own needs first, what you'll find is that that percentage starts raising back up. So yes, you're taking quality, sorry, quantity of time away from the person that you're caring for, but the quality of the remaining time starts going back up again. So as a result, you're then given sort of 90% of the time that you were given before, but at 90% capacity rather than 100% of the time at 10% capacity. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of my take on it. But I'm living from experience of this. What would be your answer? I couldn't have said it better myself, Dave, to be honest. That, that is a really good analogy. It, it, you know, I think it's not until you actually take that time out that you realise just how, you know, worn out you, you've become and how, you know, it, it can be actually quite a short break. A short break of time away can make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, so it... I was very much in the, in the situation where I thought I can't possibly take time out. I can't do that. Um, but once I'd done it once, I realised the benefit of it. So, yeah, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Well done. 
Awesome. Um, yeah, it, honestly, it's the biggest. It's probably the the one question I answer the most on everything. I've got a self self first rather than selfish. Basically, it's um, and because ultimately the type of people that gravitate towards the work that myself and Sam do are caring people. <laughs> um, and the other thing about caring people is we actually like when we're up here, we like caring for people. We feel valuable from it. We feel you know edified by it. But then when we've got nothing left in the tank, we're like, when's my turn? When's someone going to do this for me? Um, have you this? I think this one's going to be to Sarah and Colin. Have you found that COVID has slowed the response and processing of services and support, or has it continued as normal? <clears throat> well, I'll say that um, I mean we've continued to work, but I found that the the carers that I've spoken to, a lot of services that um, the person they care for previously used have been kind of temporarily closed. Some of them have been shifted online. So it's kind of part of my job to let carers know when something's been closed, if they're going online and things like that. So yes, it has had an effect, definitely. And that's had an effect on the carer <laughs> and how the carer feels. So yeah, yeah, I just think, say some people have put things online. So it's, it's part of us to kind of say, well, they're not meeting face to face, but a bit like, you know, we normally meet face to face, but at the moment we're doing this. And I think the carers that I've spoken to have found that the services for the for people that they care for, that has happened, yes. But a lot of places have kind of diversified and found new ways of doing things. So it's yeah. up to us to keep on top of um, what's actually happening on, on a week by week basis um, so that we can support our carers yeah. and the people that they care Dave, for. Each. Sorry, Dave, can I just sort of also jump in there and say that, that obviously COVID um, has, has also meant that what I found is that a lot of more partnership work is, is happening. Um, and especially between organisations and, and that's sort of a big, what I found is out of a very difficult situation, a massive sort of plus mm -hmm. is in the sense that, you know, now, obviously with a lot of people working from home and the advent of things like Zoom and, and, and Teams and stuff where you can jump from meeting to meeting quite quickly rather than actually physically having to go there, productivity and, and, and um, from from the partnership work that I do uh, for the Aero service, you know, we are now sort of partnering with a lot more agencies and a lot more organisations, making sure that carers and the issue of carers is on everybody's agenda all of the time. Yeah. So, you know, on a practical level, yes, you know, we do get carers to come to us and say, you know, why is this closed and this is not open, it used to be and stuff. But on a sort of a partnership um, what we are seeing is we're sort of in, uh, seeing an increase of, of um, work in, in that area, really. Yeah, we've seen something similar with the Mental Health Family Hour because before we did this, um, me and Sam would go into schools with his Change Talks program. Mm. I say we'd go into schools, he'd go into them more often than me. I just tagged along every now and then. Um, <laughs> but we do, the, say the talk we do on anxiety uh, that would be 20 minutes of a session in a school mm. and then we'd have to move on to something else because they only had an yeah. hour to kind of go through things and that talk that we'd see 35 pupils with that maybe and then we'd see that mm. we do that like five times in a week whereas literally it's gone to 100 <laughs> times that now which and, it's, yeah. and, it, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this as well as that we want this this is going to go on youtube it's going to go on my podcast and it'll it'll yeah. then be able to exponentially create you know pick up listeners over yeah. time um which is like so which is actually the benefit of it the, the downside to it being a double-edged sword is when people see that it's available and it's there 100 percent of the time <laughs> it's not it doesn't have the same value as a physical meeting yeah. to them they yeah. don't actually have to turn up they can they can be on mute as you said about yeah. the t-shirts earlier and stuff yeah 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 um this next question i'm really glad it got asked because i actually wanted to ask it and i'll possibly ask a follow-up to it as well um to Anne, do you think that working from home and having caring for your son being made slightly easier for you, would you then, once restrictions ease up, see if you could work from home if it ends up being beneficial to you and your son? Or do you think it's more beneficial to work out of home instead? Just wondering how the whole COVID thing has affected the way you care for your son, if that's not too personal to ask. Good question. Yeah, no, that's a, that is a good question. Um, I think it would be nice to have a balance. I think moving forward, I would look to spend some time in the office, some time at home. And I think the reason for that is it's good to get to, to go into a work environment and talk work and talk conversations that aren't related to your caring responsibilities. So I think it's, it, it's good to have a balance. I think being at work, sort of full time in an office situation was very hard beforehand um 
and put a lot of, of extra pressure on me. I think the balance moving forward will be a mixture of both. Yeah. Um, to throw myself under the bus a little bit on this, which is kind of why I wanted to ask the question is when I first got together with my wife, I was coming off the end of what well, the year before had been the, my attempted suicide. And I was like, so I was probably at the, I was not at the worst of my, that, that my condition had ever been, but I was only on my way out of it. And I was still finding it extremely difficult to care for myself. Um, and then when I start one time as in a relationship, I suddenly assumed I'm like, I can lean on somebody else for this now. And I remember being on the phone to her trying to get her to come home from work multiple times. And she actually never did at the time possibly despised her for it a little bit um however <laughs> it kind of pushed me into a situation where I had to actually self-soothe and I realized from that position that I was more capable and I was letting myself believe that I was had I think she have come home I believe that I would have expected that every single time I was having a bad day um and I think like that's that was the question I wanted to ask you is that do you think that with you being at home that the extra time that your son has maybe become expectant of that and as it was because it's it's uh, and who, you couldn't blame him if it was a yes because of course you'd want your mum there or you'd want the person that you want there rather than kind of having to do it yourself but do you think that was there anything like that was there any sort of additional expectations that okay mum's home now therefore I can I can have more care Yes, definitely. I, I, I would say that um, part of my son's condition is that he's better off with company. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't have to be me. It can be, you know, any close family member or friend that he's happy with. Um, but because of the COVID situation, there's been somebody in the house 24-7 most of the time yeah. since March um, or just before. So it's almost that getting used to, you know, when we when we come back in the new year, it's I'm going to have to help him get used to that change situation again. And, and we'll get there. You know, that's not a problem. We will get there. But it is going to be a big change. So it's something that we're going to have to work at. Yeah. Um, but it is important that he gets back to where he was with that. Yeah. Um, but it's going to take time. Yeah, there's an expression that I really love that. I, it's, a, it's a parenting expression, but it's one that I actually use for my clients. Uh, I got it from a psychologist called Richard Nichols. He's got an amazing podcast. And um, it's basically our job as parents is to prepare our child for the road, not prepare the road for our child. Mm -hmm. um, and I try and put that into practice both with my, like It took me ages to kind of realize that, um, that how much I would use a crutch if it was there to be used. And, and how much, and it took me a very long time to realize that I actually had agency and I had self-efficacy and things. This will be a weird thing for the people who are in my chat to hear now because they see the high functioning version of me that they've seen for the last <laughs> five years. Um, but it's, um, I honestly sometimes wish that people could have seen a snapshot of, that, of what I was like at that time. And um, because whenever I'm talking to a lot of people about these same issues, I get the whole, well, it's, it's easy for you. It's, it's okay for you to think like this. And I'm like, no, I wish you could see that, like what you are in that situation. But it's a very hard position to be in, especially as a parent, where you think, actually, you know what? I can either look after their needs now, but make them less capable of looking after their needs in the long run. Or I can put them through an uncomfortable position right now to look after their own needs, um, but, that, but basically have them be more self-sufficient and self-efficacy in the long run. Um, and I think, you know, commendable to you for the answer that you gave. I'm, when you said about going back, like part, like, you know, basically a mix and match, it's, um, it's what I would have recommended if I was talking to you about it, because I think, you know, you need that space. You need those conversations. Me and Sam need conversations that aren't about mental health. We don't have many of them, but we do. You know, we, we need to have conversations about, I don't know, he talks a lot running. about running. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we both went to running. Um, one second. Next question was uh, no. I've got, that was just uh, that was a link to the actual the the pack that we talked before. To Sarah and Colin, um, th this is this is quite an interesting question as well. How do you tell where the parents are the ones either causing the issues and taking advantage of their care role and or contributing to a possible decline? And how would you deal with that once you knew it was going on? Um, now That's you guys are you question. guys are um, you know primarily involved in adult care and for care adults care and for other adults right um, so this isn't as relative as relevant there but I imagine you might know some of what this is going on because we do see it obviously where a parent could be the person that is worsening the condition of the person that they're caring for whether that is an adult or a child. Sarah, 
Okay, so my first instinct, instinct in, in answering that question is we um, we have in depth conversations with carers. We you know we never make a judgment at all about who's causing. We kind of we're always focusing on on the carer, um, and depending on what's coming out of the conversation, it's always in an individual. Depending on what's coming out of the conversation, um, I mean the carer may feel they need extra support, which we can refer, whether that's counselling, CBT, family therapy, whatever. So we're always led by the carer. Um, we can never ever presume presume that. Um, no, absolutely. So, so we're just coming out of the whole conversation. And if we feel that, that we could, you know, maybe refer on, that might be helpful. We we make lots of suggestions, give lots of choices, um, but it's never for us to say, you know, this this should be happening. Yeah. So we provide lots and lots of choice and suggestions. And as I said, it's an individual, depends, depends where the conversation is going. So that's kind of my answer to that, you know. Yeah, we don't we don't make those done. We we were led by the carer, really. Yeah. Okay, Colin. Colin, is there anything? Yeah, I, I, I just just to sort of reiterate what what um, what Sarah said. Really, you know, for us, it's it's you know one of the great things about the carer's assessment is is it's very much independent of the cared for. So whatever's happening within that sort of family dynamic or or anything like that, you know our responsibility is to you know understand and and to to again offer that support to that carer irrespective of what's going on um so it's all led um and one of the ways in which i talk about the carer's assessment and often the support that we provide is that it, it it's very much a a, a informal guided conversation yeah. so there are no sort of uh, judgments or there are no preconceptions as to what's going on it's very much, this is your time, this is your opportunity, tell us how you feel. And then from that, I mean, you know, we, we never go digging for information. I mean, you know, we're not investigators or, or the assessment officers would never sort of try and pry any information out of anybody. It's very much what the carer wants to disclose, wants to talk about. Um, and, and so that's what I would probably say, that it would be very much up to the carer to how they wanted to, to discuss the situation, really. Yes, and can I just add there that, yeah, just on the back of what Colin has just said, it's um, the carer's assessment and these, these conversations that we have, it's about how do you, and in fact, it's something that I that I say to you, how do you see this? Um, always putting the carer at the forefront of the conversation. How It's not what I um, perceive, it's <coughs> what the carer, yeah. So thank you, Colin. And, and sorry, just to stress, everything that we do is confidential. Absolutely, absolutely. It's important, you know what I mean, that, that even yeah. if it's within the family dynamic is, is confidentiality is, is at the heart of, of whatever is discussed. Yes. It does remain confidential between, obviously, you know. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, it has to be. Um, I feel this question's already been answered, but I'll acknowledge it anyway. To, um, to those who are invested, have resources for carers been appropriately increased during these particularly difficult times or has access to support being negatively affected or both? I feel that we kind of sort of covered that before. Um, you got, like when we said it, it actually kind of has been both, you know, certain yeah. certain things have been put yeah. back, other things have been put in place. Yeah. So I feel like both is probably the answer to that question. Um, are carers expected to provide a higher level of care, for example, caring for someone who would have been historically hospitalised than previously? If so, has the level of support given to carers increased proportionately? God, they're, they're coming with That's the questions great, today, aren't great they? Great question. <laughs> the, um, the, the chat's evolved, hasn't it, Sam? <laughs> it has. It's, it's like university challenge here. <laughs> what cue? Um, yeah, um, if I can just get yes. So... I mean, I think that there is now starting to begin with what is to happen um, on a sort of a national, but also on a, on a regional and local level, is people are recognising the impact and, and people are recognising the contribution that carers are making. Um, and, it, and again, just to give you some sort of broad national stats, um, Carers UK did some amazing work around um, the lockdown and the result that the lockdown was having on carers. Um, and they did a, a they recently completed a report called um, Caring Behind Closed Doors, which is available online um, through the Carers UK website. Um, and again, some of the statistics that they were coming out with were, 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 were pretty horrendous, 
when you, when you're looking at some of the, the detrimental impact that on health and well-being of carers that the lockdown and, and um, but one of the things that that always strikes me is is they they almost monetize the the value that carers across the country, um, you know if, if if you could actually pay carers and if you could. And, and the figure that they came up with was that if every carer across the country dropped tools or was paid for it, it would add another £132 billion to the exchequer. You know, that's so so we're talking about the 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 crumbling of obviously the NHS and the social care is if every carer in the country decided to be paid or decided not to do it state would have to introduce an extra 130 billion pounds a year um, to actually, uh, you know, for, for the work that carers are doing. Um, I, I think that the COVID and the restrictions has meant that carers are being placed higher on the agenda. Um, on, on a lot of the meetings that I go to, um, you know, it is often talks about the impact of carers. I think that, uh, again, people are recognising what support carers can bring. Um so, yeah. yeah, so that's where I think we are at the moment. I apologise as well if I keep looking to my left. This room that I'm in is booked out for 12 o'clock. <laughs> so they, keep try- they, keep, they keep trying to come in, so I apologise if I keep going like that to that side. Yeah. That was really insightful, Colin. You know, the, the wow, the amount of money, 100, 130 billion, did you say? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Are you able to relocate, Sam, or do we need to wrap it up? I, I think I'm going to have to wrap up because all the rooms are completely okay. taken. Um, there's there's some also um, other amazing questions in the chat. One that um, Cassandra has put in is about whether it's the same for caring for, for um, caring as an a teenager for sorry as a teenager for an adult. We I would point you towards the we did an episode called um, Young Carers a few months back now, but I will drop the um, I'll drop the link into that um, shortly. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone in the chat for basically such amazing questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, we didn't thank, get, you, thank to you. All of them. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, sorry for for having to wrap up now because the the room the the rooms are all completely taken today, um, so I've only been able to book it out until twelve o'clock. Remember, it's people called keep, the mental uh, family hour ish. Ish, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've ne- we've only ever done one that was an hour. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just I just like to sort of end on just saying a big thank you to uh, Colin and Sarah for joining us. You know, the insight to your services have been it's been absolutely fantastic, and and a huge thank you to Anne for being so open. You know, I know how difficult it is, so we re- we really appreciate you coming on to this episode. Thank you so much. You know, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and for anyone watching, um, any questions that haven't been answered, which I do apologise for this. Uh, this is the first time this has happened, so <laughs> we'll. Um, well, we'll get to these questions and we will email you the answers out. If anyone does want to get in contact again, please email me on sam.tyra at lscft.nhs.uk. And just please do share this episode. So I will be sending out the recorded version afterwards. And if you could share it through your networks, that would be absolutely fantastic. So I do think this conversation has been great. So thank you to, mm. to all. Thanks for having me. Am yeah. I okay just to quickly say, if anybody does want to get in touch with our service, the number is 0345 688 7113. That's 0345 688 7113. Or email us at enquiries. So that's enquiries at lankscarers.co.uk. So that's enquiries at lankscarers.co.uk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I've just put all that in the chat as well. Chat, by the okay. way, I'm going to be disappearing at the speed of light. They're used to me hanging around for, I don't know, 15 hours or something. Um, but we are disappearing at the speed of light so that Sam can uh, disappear and get on with the rest yep. of his day. This will be going up on YouTube later on today. So if you missed any of it, you can watch it back there. And you can also watch it back on the on Twitch where the VOD will be up for a good old while. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for coming and speaking today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, thank, yeah, you. thank you, Sam, as thank always, you. for organising. Yep. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.